Blog Talk Radio. Across the country and around the world, streaming live on the internet, it's Real Estate Coaching Radio, bringing you the latest news, interviews, and secrets of the top producers. Hosted by award-winning real estate coaches, Tim and Julie Harris. Hello and welcome back and thanks for all of you who are joining us again for our daily radio show that happens every day from 12 noon Pacific till 1 p.m. Of course, Central Time, it's 2 till 3, and you guys can figure out the rest of the conversions on your own. So we are broadcasting live from here in lovely Austin, Texas, and obviously a lot of you are listening to us in replay off Blog Talk Radio or off our blog, Real Estate Insider News, or off iTunes. So all those different ways you guys are connecting with us. And I want to thank you because since we started, uh, I believe this is our, see what it say, this is our seventh show We've had almost uh, 1,500 unique listens, and I think that's a pretty big success. So thank you for all of you who are listening to us and helping us build audience. Now remember, your homework assignment, assuming you liked today's radio show, which I know you're going to love, your homework assignment, the one thing I ask all of you to do, in exchange for this wonderfully, uh, hopefully very money-making information that we're sharing with you, is to share the radio broadcast with at least 10 other agents that you know. So literally, I want you to email them, text them, Facebook them, tweet them, whatever you do to communicate with your fellow agents and let them know about this radio show. Help us uh, to, frankly, keep this radio show on the air. And the more audience we build, obviously, the more um, it will be easier for us to rationalize doing so and incurring the time expense and the money expense. So without any further delay, I always I want to welcome back my lovely wife, Julie Harris, to the call. Julie, welcome to the call. Thank you. And, of course, Rochelle is on as well. Rochelle is going to hopefully be a recurring guest on our radio show. So, Rochelle, welcome. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Good. You so, know I lady, would love that. So. <laughs> what, being a recurring guest? Absolutely. Okay, you're a recurring guest, effective. That's uh, <laughs> official. <laughs> Immediately. Okay, and, and if Julie and I have some problems with the baby or something else, you're going to be the uh, radio host, which I'm sure you'd also like. Right. <laughs> right, Rochelle? <laughs> Hello? Uh, yep, something happened to my call there, but yep, absolutely. Okay, no problem, no problem. Well, Rochelle is in, a, in uh, Columbus, Ohio, so there's going to be, I'm sure, some technical delays. So in, in any event, we always like to start, oh, by the way, the topic of today's radio show, the topic of today's radio show is something that's probably one of our favorite topics, and it's called Spokes on the Wheel. And Harris Real Estate University coaching students, Tim and Julie Harris uh, coaching students, you guys are very familiar with this topic, but it's always worth repeating. And I have to say, this and probably about four or five other topics are the things that Julie and I enjoy uh, presenting the most because it's, the, uh, it's some of the most impactful information that we have that we can share with you. It's something that really, I think, and for the most part, will clear the air, will help you realize maybe why you've been struggling in your real estate practice needlessly, and we're really going to cut through the Mickey Mouse of the way a lot of you have been taught to think about lead generation because obviously lead generation, because the focus of our radio show is making you money, right? putting you into action with the correct information that you need to help others and, as a result, making you money. And a lot of you have been given really bad, outdated information. So we're really going to beat that down today and focus on helping you understand the concept of building the spokes on your wheel. But I always like to start out every show with a couple stories from the front lines in the real estate world. And so, first of all, Julie... Yes. You have been on coaching calls, I know. You were just on a coaching call right before the radio show, and you had several more before that. Um, I am curious, what have you heard? Share with us something you learned, something one of your coaching students was experiencing that you think our listeners would benefit from hearing. Sure. Well, I just hung up with Colette McDonald, one of our HGTV rock stars down in Atlanta, one of the number one agents in Atlanta, and, of course, one of our favorite coaching clients because she's so much fun. And we were talking about how to use something we did a previous radio show on, the flexible fee commission structure. And it's interesting because Colette does not specifically target for sale by owners, However, something's happening in her market due to the low inventory, which is causing people who normally would be just run-of-the-mill listings, normal sellers, to consider being for sale by owners. 
because they know there's low inventory. They know things are selling quickly and for top dollar in her particular farm market pockets. And so she is having to deal with the FISBO or for sale by owner mindset, whether she wants to or not, because she's seeing more sellers kind of run it up the flagpole and see what happens. And she's using the flexible fee specifically to stay on the same side of the table as them and say, hey, you know what? If you bring the buyer more power to you, I'll charge you a flat fee to close it versus, you know, losing the listing altogether and being combative and saying good luck with your FISBO sign, right? Well, so what I'm hearing you say, and this makes, and this is exactly how we ask all of you to present the flexible fee, and if you did not listen to the radio show on that, you definitely want to go back and listen to a couple of days uh, ago we talked about that, really drilled down on it. But really the gist of it is is that if you, again, are willing to be uh, flexible, put it in writing, make it part of your USPs, that's unique selling proposition of why someone would want to do business with you, that reason alone, just the fact that you didn't tell that seller, no, I do not negotiate my commissions, just the fact right. that you're willing to present to the seller an alternative to the traditional commission structure, the rigid, inflexible, sort of like you know, dogmatic approach to real estate version. commissions. Exactly. I mean, even though you will most likely charge the normal rate commission in your marketplace, the very fact that you're willing to offer something different in the mind of that seller will really put you above and far beyond your competitors. So that is really something for all of you to keep in mind. And so she, but call that interestingly enough, Julie. She's been able to, through your coaching, obviously, she's been able to really transform her business now where she's focusing primarily on some of the most expensive homes and working with a lot of football players and things of that nature mm-hmm. in her market. Falcons. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the Falcons. That's exactly so, right, so, yeah. Yeah, and so her uh, the, the, the proof is that, you know, the, I'm putting that out, that the flexible fee works in all price ranges, but it does seem, to, oddly enough, Work in the price ranges where people have the most equity and the most to pay an agent. Isn't that interesting, right? Well, it's more dollars to be concerned about. (laughs) So, Julie, overall, and you and I talk about this every day at lunch, coaching students, realtors across the country seem to be, and Rochelle, I'm sure you can back us up on this, seem to be celebrating, without knowing it, a real return to force as far as real estate markets. The weather is hampering buyer activity and a lot of seller activity, but We anticipate that in about maybe a month, there is going to be a very powerful and almost overwhelming bounce back of the real estate markets as the spring flyers start to come up as the, what is it, the Arctic, what are they calling this, the Arctic? The polar (laughs) something. Polar vortex. polar, Polar vortex, yes. As the polar vortex finally goes back where it came from, we're going to see some really strong, I think very almost overwhelming amount of buyer and seller activities. And I feel from all of our coaching students the type of optimism that, frankly, I haven't really felt since 2002, 2003. There seems to be a lot of agents who are really excited about the industry again. And I don't know about you, Jules and Rochelle, but that really excites me, doesn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so, so awesome. Rochelle, what do, you, what do you, Rochelle, you have, and I always like to have you on the show, obviously, because you always have a great sort of testimonial type story to share on one of our students' success or something just, you know, that ex- you've experienced working directly with our students running the customer service thing. Well, so share with us something that you have, a story. Sure. Uh-huh. Well, the funny thing is, ever since uh, I started appearing on, on your uh, radio show, I've had a couple people that have listened and uh, requested a free coaching call from me um, to work on on buyer agent and uh, forms and things like that. So I did one this morning and got an email about an hour ago that made me very happy, so I will share that with you. Uh, It goes, uh, hi, Rochelle. Thank you so much for your call today. I have always been hesitant to use scripts and a buyer presentation with my clients which resulted in me never having any loyal buyers that were serious. With your help, you showed me how simple it is to follow a script and how the buyer presentation answers any questions the buyers may have. Your tip on creating urgency was the best advice I have been given since I became an agent five years ago. I am blessed to have you as my coach and blessed to be a part of Harris Real Estate University, and I look forward to emailing you with my results of using your proven system. Thanks again. Well, that's a very nice testimony. I should be putting that one on the blog. Yes, put send that agree. one to me, Rochelle, <laughs> so I can put it on the blog. So I thought it was interesting. You and obviously uh, you emphasized to this gal the importance of 
Um, urgency. Tell me more about that. Tell me what you said to her so all of our listeners can uh, can hopefully benefit from that. Well, sure. Um, anytime that I get or have gotten or still get a buyer, I always have this little system that I follow that creates urgency from the beginning that I uh, when I first meet with them to actually showing them houses. And one of the things that I like to do is when they send me a list of things that they're looking for, uh, four bedroom, two and a half bath, 1,500 square feet, you know, great school district. I will also not only print out, you know, three or four listings, but I also add some sold listings or in-contract listings as well so that I can show them that the market is moving. There are people buying exactly what they're looking for. Here's proof that, you know, some of the houses that probably would have fit you are already gone. And then when we go to look at the houses, I always show the best one first because then when they look at the best one first, they compare everything to the best one at the end of the uh, time that we're out. Like the script that I always use, don't be surprised if the first house you see is the one you want to buy. It happens all the time. That way when they walk into the best house, they're, that's in their mind, what I already said in the car. And then every every uh, house after that call or that house does not hold up to the first house that they saw. So in their mind they're thinking, okay, oh, my gosh, that was the best one. These are getting worse. If they get better, the houses, you know, they you so, show the best one last, they think there's more. So well, trying so to said, get, get you, that out of the way. You said something Go at ahead. the top there that I think was really valuable, and it's worth mentioning. So, again, buyers in every market are going to feel overwhelmed. And I have to say, all the syndication listing websites, considering how many of them have bad information, just makes things even more confusing. So, if you're, you know, obviously working with buyers, you're going to really have to take control of that buyer right from the beginning and explain to them that, yes, all this different information is out there, but the fact is, is most of the information that's out there is going to be outdated, and the best source of information about new listings is obviously going to be you as their buyer's agent. And then I also thought it was interesting what you said. You show them so they get a real visual of how fast things are actually selling, Kind of like if you were doing a CMA for a seller and you were showing the seller the competition, the days on the market, the list to sell price ratio, all the things that we teach you to do when presenting a really great CMA to a seller, you're essentially creating a CMA on behalf, or for the buyer showing the same information so they get a real sense of what's truly happening in the market. You're showing them that houses that are, you know, 300 to 350 that are four bedrooms in this particular neighborhood, these particular amenities, you're showing them as if they were a seller trying to establish price. You're showing to the buyer that, hey, guess what? These houses stay on the market for an average of 22 days. They sell for an average of 99% of the original list price, you know, blah, blah, blah. That way the buyer really has the exact information, realistic idea of what to offer on the house, and they feel much more comfortable moving quickly because they are not fearful of overpaying. That's, I mean, th that's a really great idea. And the other thing I heard Rochelle say is, and this is something that we teach you to do as far as Rochelle's buyer agent class. Now, not, the buyer agent training class is not something that we market and advertise, and if you're interested in, in enrolling in that class, you have to contact Rochelle directly because that's a private class that she does. And, Rochelle, what's the phone number for them to contact you directly, or how can they get a hold of you? Sure. They can reach me at 866-422-9497, and my extension is zero, and that goes directly to me. So it's 866-422-9497 if you're interested in joining Rochelle's buyer agent class. And like I said, this is a private class. She brought it up, so I'm letting you know about it. It's not being marketed or advertised on our website. So if you're interested in that class, Rochelle would be your personal coach. Um, it is a group uh, it's a group class that uh, Rochelle has when she does these calls, depending on how many people are on the call. She will leave the phone open, so there's uh, honest-to-God uh, discourse, and it's a whole process. I mean, Rochelle, as far as the buyer agent class, it's they obviously get a buyer agent presentation. In other words, guys, you get a presentation that's not so dissimilar to the presentation we treat, uh, teach you how to use when you're dealing when you're presenting to sellers. All the objection handlers. There's specific scripts that, frankly, I think there's really three scripts that you use with buyers, and uh, the floor plan script, the three times out script, and the you know when you and there's a couple others. Probably you know really three core scripts. That once you learn those scripts, your time spent with buyers is going to go from you know endless numbers of trips to three or less, and the overall stress level from having to work with buyers just evaporates. 
no matter how great of a listing agent you are, no matter how many listings you have, we will always coach you, no matter, again, how much money you're making as a listing agent, to have at least two or three really great AAA buyers. Julie, why is that important? When you have one of your great, you know, number one market leading agents, why is it that you always tell them to have two or three great buyers regardless of how many listings they have? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is it keeps you active in the market seeing lots of property, which helps you be a better pricer for both your buyers and your listings. Keeps you very, as you would say, frosty and engaged in what's actually happening. And number two, I call it your commission insurance plan because if something happens on your listing, you, you know, you thought it was priced right, but it's now it seems overpriced and maybe it's going to be a couple of weeks before the seller lets you reduce it. You know, you don't want to wait too long between your commission checks. That's one of the biggest things that we work on in coaching is ironing out the cash spurts and turning it into cash flow. Well, in order to do that, you've got to have two or three buyers in your pocket at all times, highly qualified, highly motivated, ready to rumble buyers, so that you can be putting them in contract and ideally they're not contingent on home sale, so that no matter what happens with your listings, you still have two to three closings every single month because you've been helping the buyers. And the third reason is, every time you sell a buyer a house, you should be thinking of that as a future listing for you, one, two, three, you know, seven years down the line, when you're staying in communication with them. So I think buyers are just pre-listings, really. But for the agent's sake, it helps them close the gap between their commission checks. That's true. And, you know, the best thing about working with buyers as a listing agent is you are staying on top of the market. You're knowing exactly what's going on. And yeah, probably maybe the you just price showed ranges. the comps you know, that you're using to price the house with. I mean, think of the difference between two listing agents. One of them says, by the way, I've already previewed all of the homes that would compete with you in the neighborhood because I work with lots of folks looking in this neighborhood versus the agent who just kind of throws together an MLS-generated CMA and tries to tap dance around the details. Who well, there's you more, too. There's, there's other benefits, too. I mean, let's say you're working in a small community. Julie and I have worked a lot in an area called New Albany Country Club. And in New Albany Country Club, it was very normal for listings to go through one or two listing agents before they actually sold. That was the type of market we sold in. It was very, very skills-based. And if you didn't have your you know, cats and dogs and monkeys in a row, you were not going to make any money. But when we'd show houses, because we always tried to focus on having two or three great buyers at all times, and those sellers knew their current listing contract was coming to an end with their current agent, and they were to see your business card continually on their kitchen counter after the showing, well, they're at least going to consider you to be their next, next listing agent. So, you know, the main thing is, is that working with sellers sometimes can be very – you're, you're kind of isolating yourself from the world because you're, you're locking yourself in, a, in a, a room, you're essentially focusing on doing pre-qualification, setting appointment, and then you're out in you know, presentation mode taking the listings. And then generally speaking, after you've become somewhat you know, successful, then you're able to hire an assistant or two to take care of all the paperwork. That's the model that we teach you. So it's very easy to become disconnected from what the buyer preferences are. You could, frankly, you could get all kinds of different ideas from showing new construction about construction trends, Here's, here's a concept for you. Whole communities, whole neighborhoods, sometimes tens of thousands of homes in a particular area. You know, in Muirfield, uh, Columbus, Ohio, there was an, an area called Muirfield. You guys who are golf fans, you've heard of Muirfield before. Well, Muirfield was huge in the 70s and 80s, and all of a sudden these competing neighborhoods across town started being developed. And what happens is people essentially moved out of Muirfield, moving to these new trendier areas. Have you ever considered the fact that real estate is trendy, just like fashion? The style of homes is trendy. Communities is trendy. What people put values on in terms of community values, they're all trendy. These things all go back and forth. They have, tend to have like 20 or 30 year cycles. So what was cool 20 or 30 years ago, sure enough, is cool again today. Well, that same thing holds true for real estate. So you don't know what's going on unless you're constantly staying on top of the market, doing CMAs, working with buyers. So these are all things to keep in mind to keep yourself frosty. So, Julie, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to jump right to what is one of our favorite topics, and, of course, that is your real estate wheel, or specifically lead generation best practices. We're going to get back to that topic in just a second, and here is a quick commercial break. You're listening to Real Estate Coaching Radio with Tim and Julie Harris.
Are you ready to ask Tim and Julie your toughest real estate sales, business, or lead generation question? Call us now at 347-857-1195 or email your question to questions at realestatecoachingradio.com. Now, back to Tim and Julie Harris. So today we are talking about what really is probably going to be one of the most influential, most impactful, and critical topics that we could present to you, and it's the spokes on the wheel. So this spokes concept came to Julie and I while we were selling real estate. Now this was back mainly in the uh, 90s and then in the 2000s, and we realized when we were studying the market, studying our competitors, and actually thinking about our own uh, real estate practice, we realized that for the most part there was a massive fallacy in the way that agents are being taught, and frankly, the way that a lot of people were trying to get us to run our practice when we started selling real estate back in the early 90s. And that concept is really a very outdated concept of agents doing one thing to lead generate. So before we get to specifics, I'm going to give you guys the analogy. And this is something that all of you need to keep in mind. And if you're able to, I want you to actually get out a piece of paper and a pen and follow these very specific instructions. And I promise you it is definitely worth your time. So I, it's very simple. This is two simple steps. Anybody can do it. Caveman can do it, right? So draw a circle. So draw a circle on a piece of paper. And then what I want you to do is draw a tiny, tiny little circle in the center of that circle. So what you're going to end up doing is drawing something that looks like a bicycle wheel. And, you know, think of a bicycle wheel as having a lot of spokes. But in your case, you're probably going to have seven to ten spokes by the time we're done with this analogy. So the next question I have for you and, and, the, and frankly, this is a question you should not be embarrassed about answering. It's how many spokes do you have on your wheel or how strong is your wheel? So what the heck am I talking about, Julie? What the heck is a spoke for the sake of lead generation? Well, a spoke is a source from which your deals come from. So a spoke could be past client referrals. A spoke might be NODs or for sale by owners or for rent by owners. A spoke might be a particular networking group like BNI, for example. It's essentially a pipeline of business that you can ad actually attribute business to. Otherwise, we can't call it a spoke. Well, so a lot of you don't know how many spokes you have, and I'm going to give you a, a true story. I've told this story before because it really, really represents what's happening in our industry and what has to stop because it is a absolute recipe for disaster for anybody even mildly ser serious about their real estate career. If you're essentially doing what this agent did and the story I'm about to tell you, you are 100% going to have problems in your business. There's no questions asked. All right, so this is a true story. This happened probably about five or six years ago. Um, Julie and I had restarted our coaching business after working for another prominent real estate coach for four years, and we got back into our own business. And within a short while, we were getting lots and lots of uh, calls and inquiries and a lot of people that we'd known in that company and, and, and our career selling real estate in association with Howard Britton and all these. So we started getting a lot of calls. One of the first calls that I remember getting was from one of the nation's leading agents. And this gal, a lot of you will know, especially if you come from a world of hardcore over-the-phone prospecting. And she, she basically told me, that she had heard Julie and I speak where we were talking about the spokes on the wheel. And at the time, she thought, well, I don't need spokes on the wheel. I am, you know, arguably one of the nation's best over-the-phone prospectors. This gal was one of the people that would sit themselves in a room every single day and make, you know, 30 or 40 FISBO and expired contacts, centers of influence contacts, always focusing on setting one appointment a day. So, and she was very good at it. Absolutely a skilled agent, someone to be admired, just a really fantastic salesperson. So she and I were on the phone, and I obviously knew who she was. I had spoken with her before, and she and I were talking about the fact that she always net, – well, frankly, she never questioned the fact that she was perfectly fine with how she was doing things. Every single day, headset goes on the phone. She starts calling the expireds, and the headset goes on the head, starts calling the FISBOs and expires, the centers of influence of past clients, sets her appointment. She, she goes on with her day. Well, what happens? She gets laryngitis. She gets laryngitis, and like, like most of us, I had this happen myself, so I can't really make fun of her because I did this very same thing. She had laryngitis, and she didn't stop talking. So then she started to lose her voice, and she goes to the doctor. And the doctor says, what does he tell her? If you don't stop talking, you're going to completely lose your voice. Now, she was in a position of having to prospect over the phone as her only source of business, and if she wasn't talking, she was 
frankly not making any money. She wasn't booking appointments, and of course this motivated her to ignore the doctor's sound advice and continue to prospect over the phone, and inside something like 48 hours she lost her voice. Now, she didn't just lose her voice for a day or two. She unfortunately had some sort of infection, and she lost her voice, this poor gal, for something like a month. So, true story what I'm telling you. So what happens then, her voice gets better, she gets prospecting again. Uh, She then calls us and she says, listen, I should have listened to you guys the first time around when you're talking about spokes on your wheel. Turns out, I was like one of those agents you guys were talking about, one of those one-spoke wonder agents that you guys talk about, and I only had one lead generation spoke on my wheel, and that spoke was over the phone prospecting. So here's the wheel analogy. Here's the tie-in. A wheel is rolling down the road on the front of your bike. I want you to literally visually imagine you're riding a bike. That wheel, you're looking at it. You're looking, looking down on it. It has one spoke, and let's say that is even a strong spoke. It's a carbon fiber, Kevlar, reinforced, you know, NASA-made spoke. This is a strong spoke on this wheel. You're thinking, man, this spoke kicks butt. I can handle whatever comes my way. So you hit a couple pebbles, and sure enough, the wheel, it it maintains its integrity. Then you look ahead, and you see there's a ditch. In this case, for this gal, the ditch was laryngitis. And sure enough, the wheel hits the ditch, the wheel collapses, and then you go tumbling down, having to then somehow rebuild your wheel and get back on your feet again and then eventually get back on the bike again. The problem with one spoke is it's just that. You're never going to have a very strong business. I have never come across uh, a realtor or any other salesperson or any other business owner or any other business ever that is solely dependent on one source of lead generation. And yet, and yet... I'd venture a guess that 99% of all of you listening, which hopefully by the end of this week will be about 2,000 people, I would venture a guess that virtually all of you only have one lead generation spoke. You know, and here's the challenge. You don't know it. You might think, well, Tim, I have it going on. I have business coming from 14 different websites and da 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 Really? So, Julie, how could they actually take, and it's on my notes, so how could they actually take the one-spoke wonder test. What were the three questions they'd ask themselves? Sure. So how do you know if you are a one-spoke wonder? Well, where did your closed transactions come from over the past 12 months? Now, if you're a brand-new agent, you're a little bit exempt from this, but by and large, all of you guys on this call, you should be able to track that. Where has your business come from in the past 12 months? What are the sources? Most commonly, we hear over the phone prospecting, as Tim used in the example, or it m- next most commonly would be past clients, center of influence, those types of referrals, maybe some repeat, and then after that would be paying for buyer leads. Which is something that's becoming very common. Julie, are you still online? I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's just, it's, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it sounded paying, to me too. We, it was, it's no worries. It's because we have a lot of people listening live today. <laughs> I see yeah. it from the stats. So that's it's clogging the system a little bit, but we're all good. So, yes, paying for buyer leads, which, again, we've talked about in a previous radio show, but I'm going to summarize that previous radio show. Insanity to pay for buyer leads. I received an go. email just today. Julie, did you get that email I forwarded to you about that new company yet. selling yep. buyer leads? Okay, no problem. Mm-hmm. I know you've been on the phone. So here's the thing, guys. There are so many companies that are coming out of the woodwork that are selling you guys buyer leads. I want all of you to think in your minds, if there's this many companies that have buyer leads to sell, maybe, just maybe, it's because buyer leads are incredibly easy to generate. Do it yourself. But again, Julie, I'm finding a lot of, especially new people that are calling us, and I'm having these free coaching calls with these guys, and I'm talking with them about essentially what their business is, coming, where it's coming from now, and I'm hearing more and more and more. They're paying for mm-hmm. buyer leads, which yeah. is absolutely nutty. I mean, you guys aren't making any money on them, but more importantly, it's not a reliable source of business for you. It's the very essence of a one-spoke wonder. Julie, well, how do you get the, some... The, the agents that are buying those buyer leads are the same agents who complain about terrible cash flow. Yeah, you exactly. know, the same agents that, that have a hard time pre-qualifying and following up on those leads and are also, by the way, generally pretty weak listing agents. 
or have never listed a house or, you know, are terrified to list a house. They think, oh, I'm, you know, I am a great buyer's agent. I work with buyers, and I believe I'm the best person to work with buyers and blah, blah, blah. And all that might be true, but the reality of it is, as we've discussed previously, hopefully all of you guys are getting the tenets of our, you know, essentially our religion deeply embedded in your minds. If you plan to last in the real estate business, you must, absolutely, positively must learn to lift homes. So be clear about that. So, Julie, do you have any personal experiences from any of your coaching clients that are really going to help me emphasize the importance before we get to the specifics of the one spoke wonder and how they can go about building their own wheel? Where do I wheel? begin? <laughs> yes, exactly. So, guys, what we're going to talk about next, after Julie gives you an example uh, from her personal coaching schedule, is that we're going to tell you exactly how to go about building your multi-spoke lead generation wheel and which order in which you should do it, and the order in which you should do it. Well, Tim, during and directly after the major real estate crash, the recurring theme, and, you know, when you were talking about One Spoke Wonder, I was thinking, well, how quickly some agents forget. You know, the recurring theme was, I did great during the boom, and it seemed like everybody I knew was buying and selling, as in all of your centers of influence, your friends, your family, relatives, neighbors, people who know you, and it just seemed like deal after deal after deal. Well, that was great while it lasted, but you were a one-spoke wonder, if we're being honest, because you were working just people you know, friends, family, center of influence, basically, is what we're talking about. And then when it became less fun to buy and sell, because not everybody was making a killing, you, because you had only one spoke on that bicycle wheel, there was a big old speed bump in the road. Maybe we could even look at it more of a Grand Canyon type of a cavern in the road, and so what happened? You only had one spoke. You wipe out in real estate. Then the next iteration of that was interesting because it happened all over again when many agents learned how to take advantage of the distressed market and learned short sales and REOs. And then there's a whole batch of REO agents that didn't do anything except rely on those REO spokes, one spoke wonder again, maybe two spokes, but it was basically under the same umbrella. And now those agents are coming full circle going, gosh, you know, I wish I would have talked to my past clients during that time. I wish I would have done something other than just go after the REO business because now I know I'm a one-spoke wonder. So it's not well, just one example. It's almost like the whole market has been an example. Well, so, Julie, let's really dig down. And I want you guys to all know that the reason that you think having a one-spoke real estate practice is okay is because, frankly, you've been lied to. Now, and I, and I 100% believe that you have the ability to move beyond this concept, but let's really root out where the heart of this lie is. Back in the day, let's call it this 50, well, realistically the 60s and the 70s, that's when over-the-phone prospecting was in its heyday. That's just a fact. So you saw a lot of over-the-phone prospecting, 60s, 70s, and it started to die out in the 80s. So Anyone who was teaching agents how to do anything during that era was probably teaching them how to do the things that were popular then, over-the-phone prospecting. And well, then right, we and entered it was into, pre-internet, and so that made a lot of sense. And then we entered into a nice, warm, and fuzzy stage. It overlapped with the over-the-phone prospecting in the 80s and into the 90s. Those of you who have been in the business for a long time, you remember when these trends entered the marketplace. And, you know, think about this. Again, we were talking about trends in neighborhoods. Now we're talking about trends that happen in terms of realtor education. This is an interesting concept if you guys are getting it because we're going to tell you about the future trends too. So the, then the trend was centers of influence and past clients. So if you happen to start selling real estate or your broker or office manager, whomever you, are, you got your initial training from, happened to start selling real estate during that era, they were led to believe that, Centers of influence and prospecting. You give them pies at Thanksgiving. We like pie too, but I'm not going to send you a real estate deal because you gave me a pumpkin pie. You know, there's uh, forget me not sees all these little chotsky gimmicky things that became popular in the 80s into the 90s. And so a lot of you again were just solely saying, well, I have to do over the phone prospecting, and still to this day. You know, that is still the belief. Some people actually are led to believe that you can only and should only do one specific thing over the phone prospecting. If it's not that, and very rarely do you find people doing both, it's, it's centers of influence and past clients. I'm a referral person. I don't, you know, why I would never call it this I only work referrals. Book. 
Right. I mean, that again, that was very, very common to hear that. In the 90s, you'd actually see people walking around on their business cards that said, you know, referrals only. And it's like, oh, well, I, you, no one yes, referred Judy. me to you, but I was about to, you know, ask you if you want to do business with me. But, I mean, since you're referral only, I guess I'll ask somebody else. I mean, so these are all trends, guys. You've got to really see them for what they are. And now the trend that sort of has come and gone really relatively quick, it started in about 2005, and I think it's kind of petering out, is this whole social networking trend. Now, let's be clear. All of these trends have value. They all can be a spoke. But to have them as your sole source of business is insanity. And the, the, the sort of social networking trend, that's, I think, evaporating quicker than maybe the previous trends have. In other words, quickly people were able to figure out that, guess, I, you know, hey, guess what? I cannot build a lasting real estate practice just from social networking. Now, the new trend is, is the buying of buyer leads. And that's, that's, I think, personally, worse than all the other trends combined. Not just the buying of buyer leads, but the willingness to pay for leads at all. And you guys rationalize it by saying, well, Tim, sure, I could learn how to do X, and you could teach me how to do Y, but the fact is, is that's going to take time, and for that same amount of money, I could actually go and buy a buyer lead, or I could you know, hopefully buy a listing lead. Well, here's the reality of it is, if you learn how to do it yourself once, then you never have to learn how to do it again. Yes, you'll have to keep your skill set up, and yes, you'll have to get better. But once you learn how to do it yourself, if you could learn how to plant your own garden, grow your own vegetables, and you became really efficient at it, you'd never have to go to the grocery store again versus having to go to the grocery store every single week to buy your produce. It's a similar concept. You know, you teach a person to fish, they eat for a lifetime. You give a person to fish, then basically they eat for a day. You've all heard these types of concepts. That's the inherent flaw in this current trend of buying leads. There is every reason to believe that we are just at the start of the buying leads uh, cycle. And you're going to see, I suspect, some of the major syndication, you know, listing syndication portals. You guys know who I'm talking about, the Zillows, the Trillias, the Realtor.coms, and some of the other minor ones. Those are the three big ones. I would not be surprised at all if in some form they move to a referral-based model where they start referring leads out. Because you guys will buy them because they know agents will buy them. Mm -hmm. you know, they know agents will pay them $500 a month and then pay 30 or 40% of their referral fee. If you are one of those agents and you're realizing now that you're falling prey to that new trend, stop yourself. It's not going to end well for you. So the concept here is you have to have multiple spokes on your business, in your, uh, on your lead generation wheel. You cannot just be solely reliant on one source of business. You have to be thinking in terms of what if one of these spokes fails, will I have the other ones to back me up? Does it make sense for me to be putting all my eggs in one basket? Jules, what are your thoughts? Well, so I, I just have example after example in my mind of agents that say, <laughs> you know, you can, you can really pick on any one spoke, right? There is uh, several companies that have recently gone out of business that, you know, were actually online either referral or paid sources, okay? So what if that was one of your main sources of business? I remember a coaching client that was very, very dependent on one particular relocation company, and it was through her broker, and it was just the gravy train of one after another relocating executives. Well, that company decided to move their account to a different brokerage. She literally went from doing 50 to 60 transactions like clockwork every single year, year in and year out. She's in the Washington, D.C. area to literally nothing because during that time she hadn't done anything else. She hadn't developed a past client list, hadn't learned how to talk to for sale by owners, you know, anything. It was just reload. So it's not that we're per particularly picking on anything, although the paid buyer leads is an obvious one since, you know, the thing that comes to my mind is how much skill does it take to give somebody your credit card number and have them charge you for supposed leads? That doesn't take any skill. So really the issue is working multiple spokes requires that agents get smarter and better and faster and more skilled and be more engaged in their business. So to me, if I'm being really, I don't know, direct about this, I think having one spoke is kind of lazy. And well, it ends up biting you in the end eventually. Go ahead. It's, really, it's, like, it's like all the shortcuts that people take in life, right? Yeah, exactly. It's like all the silver bullet things that are out there. 
the, the, the stuff that has true lasting value is the stuff that is going to require some effort. Now, Julie, as soon as you went down that road, I do realize the fact that all of our potentially 2,000 listeners today, probably nine, I'm guessing 1,995 of them started tuning out because they don't like oh, yeah. being told that they have to do stuff that they don't want to sure. do. So for the, five of you, for the five of you who are listening right now, you know, you have to really accept the fact that if you're willing to put in the effort, if you're willing to go to the gym every day, and you do it every day for an hour, and you take care of your body, guess what? You're going to be healthier, and you're going to look fantastic. If you're willing to save money off every transaction, as we teach you to do, if you're willing to then invest that business and not just go to Vegas and bet it all on black, over time, you're going to accumulate enough money that you're going to be financially free. You see, all the greatest rewards in life happen as a result of consistent effort Hey, this is another thing you hear us say a lot. Doing what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it at the highest level results in pretty much everything that you're trying to accomplish in your life. Learning skills, learning how to do stuff that other agents don't know or won't know ever know how to do gives you an unfair – I used to say almost unfair advantage, but it's not even almost. It's an unfair advantage in your marketplace. So – Julie, if they wanted to build, you know what, we're going to save this for after our short break. Rules for sure. building your wheel, and we're going to run by, we're going to go through what I think I have here, about a dozen of the top, and frankly, the easiest to build spokes that you should be putting on your wheel first. So after the quick break, we are going to be covering that. So back in about a minute. Everyone knows that real estate coaching can be expensive. Most coaching companies charge $1,000 a month and demand that you sign a long-term, ball-and-chain, 12-month contract. But what if there was a proven system that gave you the essentials to almost guarantee your real estate success? The marketing and lead generation systems, centers of influence and past client systems, business systems, scripts, and presentations, everything you need to dominate your real estate market. Real Estate Coaching Essentials is that system, and it's affordable for every agent who's ready to take their business to the next level. For a limited time, Tim and Julie Harris are offering this award-winning program for only $197 a month. You can enroll right now and receive the first seven days for free. That's right. Enroll today and take the next seven days to have complete access to everything you need to build a successful real estate business. Get started today at agentcoachingsecrets.com. Again, that's agentcoachingsecrets.com. Okay, we are back. So again, a, a lot of you guys are joining the agent uh, real. I'm sorry, the uh, <laughs> real estate essentials coaching program, and we just gave you information on how to do that. So definitely. Uh, participate, become a coaching student. We'd love to have you enroll. Um, our guest call in line is 347-857-1195, 347-857-1195. And um, a lot of you are listening in replay on iTunes and whatnot. And you can email us your questions about this or any of our previous shows. And we cover most of those on Friday, most of the call in, uh, most of the emailed in questions we cover on Friday on the Ask Your Toughest Real Estate Coaching uh, Call show, and that happens on Friday. But in the meantime, let's get back to the spokes on the wheel. So at this point, all of you should be convinced that you need to have multiple lead generation spokes. And all of you really should be convinced that and realize that a lot of the ways that you've been doing business haven't, you know, the, the struggles really at this point because you have the knowledge, the struggles going forward that you've been having with consistent lead generation is your fault. Up to this point, wasn't your fault because you were counting and expecting on the people, the office managers, your broker, your maybe other people, you were expecting them to give you really great advice. Now, you know, it makes sense that they would have tried, but you also have to realize that their advice that they can give you is limited by their own experiences, and their own experiences, unfortunately, is often limited to their willingness to learn. What often happens, as happens in any career, if people get to a point, a level of success, whatever that level is for them in their minds, and then they stop learning. They become complacent. You run into that all the time. People that really haven't updated their skills in ages, 
Well, if that age happens to be 20 years ago, chances are they are loyal, over-the-phone prospectors. Let's just hope and pray they don't get laryngitis, or they're really focused on centers of influence and past clients. The reality of it is, is a one-spoke wheel is a wheel that will break. And when it does, it's, you know, the, the ramifications of being a one-spoke wonder, as we call them, is scary. So accept the fact that most of you are one spoke wonders and move and let's move forward and let's talk about how we can finally build a really strong everlasting wheel. Jules? All right, perfect. So how do we actually build a wheel? Well, the first rule is that you're going to actually complete one spoke before moving to another. So instead of dabbling with or tweaking or playing around with some particular type of lead generation no matter what it is, you're not going to quote try it out. You're not going to try to work expireds, for example, or try to learn to be a networker. You're going to become the best at that spoke before you add another spoke. Instead of going from thing to thing, as we said on yesterday's show, we nickname lovingly those types of agents as samplers, where they just kind of dabble and try things out and, oh, I tried calling expireds, but nobody was home. Expireds don't work. Well, what do you have, a grand total of a half an hour in that? That's not a spoke. A spoke is something that you specifically study, develop, become great at, become the best in your market at that. Then you can add your second spoke. So you've got to check that they are still performing to make sure that you've built it correctly. How do you know if your spoke is working well? It's fairly obvious. You can actually real business to it. Does that make sense, Tim? Julie, why is it that agents are so willing to basically uh, abandon something? Why is it that they're such samplers? Why does that happen in your opinion? Well, I understand that they want to believe that whatever they're buying or learning today is going to be the greatest thing since sliced bread and solve all of their lead generation issues. I appreciate that thought, and I wish it was that simple. But the fact of the matter is most things take some studying and tweaking and perfecting. So I, I think that agents want to believe that whatever they're working on is going to work. And I think their heart's in the right place, but they fall short of understanding the steps that it takes to actually monetize what they're working on. And I think about things even like uh, the Craigslist ads that we teach in our short sale class. It's not just throwing a Craigslist ad up. It has a lot to do with how you word it and how frequently you run that and are you tracking that ad and do you know which one works the best and then are you doing more of that and killing the things that don't work. So I, I think it's mostly a mindset thing but also a what we call a stick to you know, You have to give it all you've got before you declare it a good spoke or not a good spoke. Well, that's, also, that's an interesting point as well. I mean, here's the reality of it is, is that, you know, you really have to make sure that before you move to one, it's a common uh, situation. We get a call from somebody who wants Julie and I to be their personal coach. So they want to join the Real Estate Coaching Essentials Program. And we ask them, we go through this, you know, relatively lengthy process where we're getting to know the student. And you guys are all different. There is no one specific recipe or formula that we prescribe to you to do in your real estate practice because all of you have your strengths and your weaknesses, right? You have to have a customized approach to every coaching client. So let's, we're going to discover that in most cases, some of you have kind of a mismatch source of business. So I get some from the centers of influence and some from my church and my old neighborhood. And I had this postcard that I think worked a couple times and I bought a few leads off Zillow, whatever the heck it is that you're doing to generate business. It's not an organized approach. And one thing that we'll discover when we have that first phone call, the two of us, is that you are not really good or the best at any of those different things that you're doing right now to get the business from. You just, in a lot of ways, got lucky. Or, you know, a lot of you get uh, business from call-ins or you get business from a referral from that where you're paying 40%. And so maybe we'll go through your business and we'll determine that you're paying so much of those referrals that after you pay your broker, after you pay the referral fee, you're really making nothing. You might as well be working at Walmart, right? But then we're, we're going to determine, well, that spoke needs to be cut loose. It just doesn't make sense for you to be spending your effort and your energy on that specific lead generator. So in those particular examples, we cut them loose. We let them go so you can then focus on the things that are going to make you the most money the quickest. So lesson number one 
is we have to really do an honest valuation of where your business is coming from. Lesson two, we have to then determine whether any of those things that you were doing to generate the business, are those duplicatable or did you just get lucky? You can't count on call-ins, for example, right? You can't count on some of the sources that we get business from occasionally. So where did your business come from, number one? Number two, is it duplicatable? If it is, can we duplicate it? How can we make it better? Then we go on to new spokes. So many of you, like Julie said, are so addicted to the silver bullet. It's this time of year when you guys are going to get hammered with all the silver bullet salesmen that are going to go to your local office. They're going to, you're going to be called out to some dank hotel <laughs> to sit in some hotel and drink bad coffee and hear somebody talk, and then at the end of the day he's going to sell you fill in the blank. This is the time of year when those road shows start. This is the time of year when you're going to be tempted and you have to say, not just no, but hell no, I'm not getting suckered into that. I'm going to focus right. on what I know works. This is how business people think. And the one, and if I add any spokes, it's only going to be once I have really become the absolute master of that previous spoke. I think that's pretty clear. So, Julie, in the order in which we should be presenting or in the order in which they should be adding spokes, let's go through this. Sure. So number one for everyone needs to be your center of influence, which is simply people who you know, people who know you, and your own past clients. Virtually all of you have past clients, and even if you don't, you still have a center of influence, friends, family, relatives, neighbors, people who you know. This is the easiest to set up and the least resistant. These are people who already know, love, and trust you. After that, next easy to set, to set let me, up. Let me interrupt, Julie. Go ahead. Give me a second. Sure. So the first spoke is the easiest to set up and has the least resistance, and we know that when you start coaching with us, you will do it without us having to hold a gun to your head. So that's going to be your first thing. True. But unfortunately, that will always be your weakest spoke because – when the, for example, when the real estate market slowed down and all of you guys who are solely dependent on centers of influence and past clients to get your business, guess what? You got no business because you never learned how to generate business from any other source. That's when you started having to learn how to do short sales and some of the other things the market demanded. So centers of influence and past clients, we're talking about your social sphere when it comes to this. If you have no past clients, real estate clients, do you have past clients from your previous career? Things like that. So the first spoke is essentially an exercise in you pulling out names and email addresses from your phone, from your Rolodex, from your old Christmas card list. And then we teach you a, a very effective way to communicate with those uh, potential sellers and buyers on a regular basis in a manner in which they want to be communicated with where you're not annoying them. Because it's going to be too weird for you to be having to solicit your Aunt Elma for a real estate transaction. You know That's just too weird. So you need to do it in a nice, easy to understand, acceptable way so that they welcome hearing from you, even if they know that one of your motivations is, you know, whom do you know that I can be helping buy or sell a home, which is a question that we teach you to ask. So, Julie, moving on. All right, so the next one after that is business networking, groups that exist specifically for business networking. So this is related to your first spoke, your center of influence, but definitely more on a professional level. For example, BNI, Chamber of Commerce, these types of things. And it doesn't even have to be focused on business. It can be other things that are related to stuff that you like to do. One of the things I do with my coaching clients is we create what we call a center of influence and networking calendar with repeating events so they are talking to people all the time, being themselves, but talking about real estate. So that's easy to systematize, automate, and schedule. The next so one the after next that one, is per, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So again, we're, uh, taking, professional you from the referrals, yeah. we're taking you from the, the easiest to the thing that requires no skill up to the things that start to require more skill. And, Julie, I'm just going to go through these for the sake of sure. time. Shoot. The next one is professional referrals. That would be from different sources where you can uh, join the program and start getting mostly listing leads. Um, and those of you who are in Real Estate Coaching Essentials or one of our other coaching, le uh, I'm sorry, coaching programs, you know what those sources are. So, again, professional referrals would be the next one. There are very, there's, I think, probably about a half dozen really great sources for paid referrals. Yes, I know that we talked about paid referrals a second ago, but notice I'm saying that that is a spoke, not your only spoke, right? The next one would be expireds and FISBOs. 
We're going to give you new generation scripts. We're going to show you exactly what to say, how to say it, dealing with the types of challenges and thoughts that people in this generation have when it comes to listing their house or how, you know, as a for sale by owner or wanting to have you help them get their house relisted and sold as an expired. Next, we take you through, again, we're going from things that require no skill to things that start requiring more skill and more money. Next, we're going to take you through direct mail. Direct mail is very complicated, very specific. There's an art to it. Coaching students, when you get to building that spoke, we'll obviously walk you through that. After that, we're strong advocates of various forms of Internet marketing. Internet marketing can take, take the form of pay-per-click. Uh, it can take the form of remarketing ads. There's lots and lots of things you can be doing online. Again, we're going up the gamut. Easiest, least resistance, now most resistance. You have, an, I would put social networking, honestly, I would put that in the same bucket at this level if you're doing it, if you're doing paid social networking ads. That goes into that specific bucket. Next, we're going to move into Internet radio shows and other things like what we're doing here. We can teach you how to do an effective and market to your audience an effective Internet radio show. It takes time, takes skill, takes effort, and takes money. Up from there, we're going to teach you how to do radio ads. Now, these are the AM radio ads that you hear on talk radio. As you progress, then you're going to do the FM radio ads. Radio ads, when done effectively for the agent that's ready for that, the agent that can sustain that level of financial commitment, can be very effective. Um, with very few exceptions, all of our top coaching clients are running radio ads. After that, yes, TV ads. TV on cable has become really, really cheap by comparison to the way it was, say, 20 years ago because there's so many channels, and well-done, well-placed Cable TV ads are even more effective than radio ads. Those of you who are doing radio ads and you're having a great success at it, you need to evolve your marketing and start taking the same overall concept from your radio ad, and you need to start doing uh, TV ads. Now, for the sake of time, I can't go through the 20, 20, 20, 20, about 40 other lead generation spokes that we will teach folks how to do. But remember, the strong wheel that you're after doesn't have 40 or 50 spokes. Realistically, it has five to seven spokes max. So that should be your ultimate result is you're going to have one spoke built, one spoke strong, then you're going to add another, then you're going to add another, then you're going to add another. Then you're going to have a lead generation spoke, a lead generation wheel that's going to be strong, that if one spoke fails, you have the others to back it up. Those of you who have experienced inconsistent cash flow, which is all of you, you know what I'm talking about. You know how critical it is that you adapt your mindset and adapt your thinking to realize that you need multiple spokes, but don't make the mistake of being a sampler, going from one spoke to the next. Jules, as we, as we wrap up today's show, any thoughts you have? Well, so I want to drive that point home that just because you have this spoke polished and working today and you now have the freedom to build your second spoke, be very careful not to abandon that first spoke and just assume that it's going to go run itself. It still needs some care and feeding. You know, if the first one is your past client center of influence list, you're using your database, you've systematized and automated, that's great. You still have to update and polish that list all the time as you have more closings and adopted clients and your center of influence expands. You've got to keep that going. Will it be as challenging as when you first built it? No. It, it should be up and running to the point where you're just taking after it and keeping an eye on it. So be careful that when you go to the next thing, you don't act like a sampler and throw out that last one and just say, oh, well, I, I did that the first 90 days. Now I'm doing this new thing. The idea here is to build your spokes in the wheel so that ultimately tomorrow morning when you wake up and you go to your, quote, work day in real estate, if the real estate gods don't decide to anoint you with a past client referral today, because that is not particularly predictable, yes, you can systematize and automate and get more, but maybe today is not going to be a past client referral day. Well, if you have expired skills and if you've been doing some networking, you're not in trouble. You're still going to have new leads to follow up on versus the agent who is solely dependent on any one thing. Make sense? So, Julie, we're coming to the end of today's show. Um, your homework, everyone, from today's show is obviously to share your uh, enjoyment, hopeful, hopefully your enjoyment, hopefully the fact that we're helping you move your business forward with at least 10 different agents. So help get the word out about today's radio show. Please share today's radio show with at least 10 other agents, and we'll talk with you tomorrow. Is coaching right?
right for you? And how can I guarantee it will work for me? Chances are you are asking yourself those questions right now. I'll answer those critical questions for you in just a moment. But first, let's be honest about something you may have always suspected. You've probably always known that the nation's top 1% of realtors, you know, those millionaire agents you see on TV, they possess a secret knowledge that the other 99% of agents do not have. Where do they learn what they know? And more importantly, how do they learn how to put this closely guarded information into money-making action? It's simple. They have a coach. Not just any coach. The nation's mega millions, top 1% of the realtors know that in order to maintain their almost unfair advantage, that they must have their own personal coach, a proven market-tested coach who has truly walked in their shoes, a coach who has worked with many of the nation's leading agents. At this point, you're probably ready to maybe try coaching. However, you don't want to be unfairly locked into a long-term ball and chain that coaching contracts can give you. It just makes sense that you should be able to try it before you buy it. Even more importantly, you want to have a coach who is the best of the best not someone who is simply assigned to you, or even worse, has never sold real estate. Can you imagine? If this is you, I have something for you right now that is exactly what you have been looking for. For the next 48 hours, Tim and Julie... 